Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us. With the April 9th Israeli election fast approaching, the nation is in full swing election mode. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has announced that he is seeking re-election for the fifth term as Prime Minister. The question is, one of the questions is, why is Netanyahu spending so much time meeting, making deals, and hobnobbing with leaders of other nations, rather than domestic campaigning? At home, Netanyahu rarely accepts requests for interviews from Israeli media, and it appears to most people that when he is, he's focused on Israel hosting world leaders, such as Narendra Modi from India, or Viktor Orban from Hungary, or Shinzo Abe from Japan, and others. The rest of the time, Netanyahu is abroad, attending the Paris summit commemorating 100 years to the end of World War I, and then attended the Weisgard Group, which is important to talk about in Budapest, Hungary, and from there, he flew to the inauguration of Brazilian President Bolsonaro. So what's at play here? Here are some of what he had to say there. This is a great day for Brazil and a great day for the Brazil-Israel alliance. As President Bolsonaro said, the Brazil-Israel brotherhood. Brotherhood, the alliance that you mentioned is real and can carry us to great heights. So why is Netanyahu spending so much of his time abroad pursuing foreign leaders? What exactly is the Israeli foreign policy and relations? Why does he seem to be making alignments with the most right-wing leaders, many of whom have been accused of being anti-Semitic and being fascist? Here to discuss all of this with us is Real News correspondent Cher Heber, who joins us from Heidelberg, Germany. His most recent book is The Privatization of Israeli Security. And Cher, always great to have you with us. Welcome back. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Mark. So let's just get right to this. I mean, so Netanyahu is under investigation in Israel for several corruption cases. His victory in April in the elections that are taking place in Israel are not certain, not guaranteed. Um, so what do you think is at play here with all his traveling abroad instead of focusing in on Israel itself? Well, I think Netanyahu is uh, currently winning the popular vote uh, hands down. Uh -huh. um, his his uh, support is, is overwhelming com considering all of his opponents. And I think it's because he understands something very deep. Because uh, if you look at the other political parties in Israel, they're starting to talk about uh, what are their proposed plans for the failing education system in Israel, for the crisis in the health system. Uh, and some of them also talking a little bit about restarting the peace process with the, uh, the occupied Palestinians. Nobody's talking about Gaza. Uh, and Netanyahu is not talking about any of these things. Uh, in fact, Netanyahu doesn't even have any, any kind of platform. Uh, if you look at the kind of billboards that he's putting out now, um, he's saying, uh, we'll not let the, the journalists decide who the prime minister is. Uh, we'll vote for Netanyahu to spite. Just so. Uh, which is a very strange campaign slogan. But I think it's because <laughs> Netanyahu understands something very deep. He understands that the real elephant in the room is the occupation of Palestine. And the real elephant in the room is the fact that Israelis are terrified that uh, if they uh, will be held accountable for that occupation, uh, the Israeli foreign relations will deteriorate, the boycott movement, the BDS movement is going to uh, wreak havoc on the Israeli economy, uh, and a lot of Israelis are very concerned about what it could mean uh, for them traveling abroad and being seen as uh, colonizers uh, in an apartheid state. So what Netanyahu is actually saying, let me show you by doing and not by saying, how I'm creating new alliances for the Israeli uh, state and creating new friends and reaching out to additional, uh, to countries that didn't even have diplomatic relations with Israel for decades. Uh, his most recent visit was to Chad in Africa, and now he announced that he's also going to try to restart diplomatic relations with Mali uh, in Africa. Um, hmm. and, and all of this is in order to show that actually maybe Israel doesn't need to uh, worry about uh, criticism coming from the West, coming from Europe, coming from democratic countries, because uh, they can make new friends. And I think uh, this is a message that uh, Netanyahu understands can soothe the Israeli public and, and assure them uh, that uh, the real issue of, of the occupation, the boycott movement, uh, the, the siege on Gaza, right. will not affect their lives. So, so one of the things here, that with, with this kind of unprecedented move of his moving around the world in ways he hasn't done before, and Israeli leaders haven't done before, and it, it makes sense what you're saying here, I mean, because relations are even warming with a lot of the Arab Gulf states, which have been traditionally, at least on the surface, enemies of Israel, but also those are states that have really 
um, not really have reluctantly and been forced to support the Palestinians, not that they're in love with the Palestinian movement themselves because of what it portends for their own country. So, so, uh, so how much of this has to do with U.S. and Iran? How much of that has to do with what you're describing here in terms of, um, in terms of the game to build support even with those who once really were always verbally attacking Israel? Um, well, yeah, actually, if you look at the, the new friends of Israel, countries that uh, have in the past um, were very aloof or standoffish in their foreign relations with Israel or, or didn't have any kind of relations, uh, I think uh, the reason for that is that um, those countries need uh, more support from Israel, but I also think uh, more, more, uh, recognition from Israel, uh, partially because they are themselves isolated in the world just like Israel is becoming isolated, uh, isolated okay. from international organizations and from uh, the, the UN and from uh, the European Union. But I think um, a lot of this is just lip service. A lot of this is really on the surface. If you look at the trade relations of Israel with the rest of the world, you see that Europe remains the biggest trade partner of Israel, followed by the United States. And all of the other countries that uh, Netanyahu is visiting or uh, whose heads of state are visiting Israel uh, are not trading with Israel in large amounts at all. Mostly, we're talking about the arms trade. Uh, Duterte from the Philippines, for example, was uh, has visited Israel uh, in September. And he was criticized, of course, uh, by journalists for his uh, horrible statements uh, condoning sexual violence and murder uh, and, and right. uh, comparing himself to Adolf Hitler. And when he was confronted with this accusation, uh, Duterte answered, well, I'm buying a lot of weapons from Israel. And that was uh, his way of, of telling the Israeli journalists, get off my back because uh, I'm on your side. And I think that's exactly the kind of relationship which is very short-term, short-sighted, uh, alliance about about uh, arms deliveries and and some photo ops, but uh, in terms of Israel's real long term foreign uh, uh, relation interests, uh, that that is something that Netanyahu is not improving at all, and in fact uh, Israel continues to become more and more isolated. So uh, so Duarte is 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 is, um, is one example, but Netanyahu seems to be forming close relationships with all kinds of right wing governments. Some of them, as I said earlier. Uh, are just outright fascistic and known as anti-Semitic. I mean, Orban, you know, openly leading anti-Semitic measures in, in Hungary and denying their role in the Holocaust and, and, uh, and propping up people who were part of killing hundreds of thousands of Jews in World War II during the Holocaust. So, and they're courting him as well and honoring him. You know, his relations with people like Matteo Salvini in Italy and, 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 uh, and, and many others. So, I mean, so what is that about? The Polish prime minister, who was, wants to make it a crime to say that, Polish, that Poles were involved in, in complicit in the Holocaust. I mean, so he's hobnobbing with these folks. So what is that about? Well, what's being built here? You're raising a lot of points here, and I'm I have sorry. to say uh, we have to be a little bit careful about uh, using the term fascism, uh, because yeah. I think we may lose picture of what's really happening. This rise of the new populist right, this alt-right, people like Orban uh, are fans of Horty, who was the leader of Hungary during second, the Second World War and right. was absolutely a fascist. Yes. Does that make Orban also a fascist? I'm not completely sure. I think he's something a bit different, and, and we shouldn't be falling to the trap of okay, just... Okay, so, so, so I'll, take, I'll, ta I'll put the word fascist aside for now. <laughs> take yeah. It, but, but, yeah, but I, but I also have to say that when you talk about uh, the Pol Poland wanting to make uh, that statement illegal, they've already did. The law right, passed. Right, And right. it passed with the blessing of Netanyahu. And I think that's part of the point, uh, because these uh, right-wing uh, leaders, uh, extreme right-wing leaders... Uh, in, in Poland, in Hungary, also now in Brazil, in, in the Philippines, and elsewhere, um, are, are facing a legitimacy problem. And be, because they are immediately being seen as part of a, a, of a very scary right-wing movement, and they're called, uh, for example, far-right leaders, which hints that they are, in fact, fascists and maybe also a pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic. And some of them are, like Orban, of course. Right. Uh, and so by getting a, a photo opportunity with Netanyahu, by visiting Israel and going to the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, uh, they can absolve themselves of those accusations and legitimize themselves. But what does it do so for Netanyahu? They have a lot to gain from those photo opportunities with Netanyahu. Salvini, just a couple of months ago uh, uh, from Italy, uh, recommended to make a register of the Sinti and Roma people living in Italy, just registering them 
uh, as, as a separate kind of population, which is exactly the policy of uh, uh, preparing for ethnic cleansing, cleansing or genocide. He, he was uh, not able to do that. But then he comes to Israel and uh, visits the occupied uh, part of, of Jerusalem and meets with Netanyahu, and su suddenly it's all okay again. And uh, he won't be accused of being an anti-Semite and, and a fascist because Israel gives him a, a kosher stamp. But, but to, to conclude this, I mean, Shira, so what does Netanyahu get out of this? I mean, he's running for uh, to be prime minister again for, for a fifth term. So what is he getting out of these relationships and this hobnobbing with these right-wing leaders across the planet? Well, uh, he's telling the Israeli public, vote for me even though I'm a liar. He doesn't say that he's a liar, but everybody knows that he's a liar. But I'm lying for your behalf, he says to the Israelis, because if he can get all of these uh, schmoozing with, with uh, world leaders around the world and, uh, and call this improving Israel's foreign relationship and therefore give the Israelis this assurance that uh, the occupation doesn't matter, the boycott doesn't matter, uh, we don't have to worry about the UN uh, um, condemning Israeli actions uh, and, and violating international law and so on, because we have new friends all around the world, then the Israelis say, well, maybe he's the leader we need. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is corrupt, somebody who is um, not, not an honest politician, but he uses his corruption for us. And he uh, uses his very uh, powerful um, skills at, at rhetorics, at speaking, at public speaking on our behalf. And I think this is what is uh, assuring his re-election in the upcoming election, barring only the Israeli police putting him in handcuffs. Well, there, there's a lot to unpack here, Shir, and I guess we can unpack it in, in subsequent conversations together because we really do have to. This is really very critical. Uh, and I agree with you, by the way. I think the, the, the term fascist is overused. I was just getting a tad emotional for a moment, I guess. So, Shir, Ever, thanks so much for joining us once again. Thanks for all your work. Thank you, Mike. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thank you all. Take care.